Good morning and happy Father's Day, the first Pentecostal, to all those fathers that are biological or that they are mentors or that they're spiritual fathers. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, today we're going to continue with our Sunday class. And as a matter of fact, um, the title today is God of the Faithful. But just doing a quick recap on our lesson from last Sunday, it was titled, God of Your Fathers. And the series deals with God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a study by Nathan D. Mackey. The focus last week, it was dealing with imperfect men, talking about Moses and all his imperfections, but God desires to empower us to become what we're meant to be. And that's just what God did with Moses. Today's lesson, God of the Faithful, the focus is, just as God showed patience with Abram, who sought the promise of God, God desires to empower us to become faithful in our pursuit of the promise he has for us. So many, God gives them promises and almost at the time of victory we give up and we're going to see how Abraham stayed faithful to the promise that God gave for him so our foundation our scripture focus we're going to find it in Genesis chapter 11 verses 27 through 32 and then we're going to jump over to chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. And I feel I need to lay a foundation because we're going to talk about different struggles that Abraham, Abraham went through. And yet God continued renewing his promise. And Abraham, towards the end, was recognized as a father of faith. He did not waver in the promises of God. So let's start with verse 27 of Genesis 11. This scripture that we're going to read now talks about Terah, who is Abraham's father. And we're going to notice that Terah started a journey that it was in God's plan for Abraham to complete. Terah was headed to Canaan and he made a stop at a city in Haran and never Terah never completed the journey but then God called Abraham so let's start in verse 27 this is the genealogy of Terah Terah begot Abram Nahor and Haran Haran begot Lot and Haran died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans then Abram and Nahor took wives the name of Abram's wife was Sarai and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Ishka. But Sarai was barren, she had no child. Verse 31. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. I want to make mention that this was right after Babylon had taken, I'm sorry, right after the Tower of Babel had taken place. Terah, being the patriarch of the family unit, was the one who led the march northwest following the course of the mighty Euphrates River. But when they reached the region of Assyria, for some reason, Terah decided to settle there. He named the place Haran after his dead son, and he and Abram began to build the life there, as we saw in verse 31 of Genesis 11. So let's move over to chapter 12, and we'll read the first nine verses. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and your father's house. Look at the instructions that God gave, how specific they were. To a land that I will show you, I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth 
shall be blessed. That is a promise even to us. Amen. Verse 4. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. Let's pay close attention to that. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all the possessions he took that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, he also took that, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the Terebinth tree of Moreh. And the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abraham journeyed, going on still toward the south. Now, the writer, Nathan Mackey, he poses a couple of questions that he feels that Abraham is probably pondering in his mind when he received that um, it, those instructions from the Lord. But even Mackey's point of view as well, he said, as though he was Abraham, can I really do this? He had the Euphrates on one side, which it was helpful uh, for agriculture and for the cattle. On the other side, he had high walls of the city that were patrolled by um, armored soldiers. And in Abraham's mind, he says, could he really leave this? Could he take his wife to an unknown place and who knows what kind of dangers he was going to face? Then he looked around and he saw all the false gods that these people were worshiping and everything. And he, the words that God spoke into his mind, they were recalled at the time, sounding loud and clear. Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house. Amen. But where was God going to lead him? Did he really need to leave his family behind? He had already lost his brother Haran, cut off far too young. Leaving Ur would mean abandoning the care of his brother's grave. Surely Abraham could take Lot. He couldn't leave the son of his dead brother Haran behind. It could be like losing his brother all over again. Surely the Lord would not begrudge him taking his family with him. You know, that's called reasoning. The Lord gives us today instructions and we try to reason how to do it instead of asking God specifics or instead of following the instructions that God has given us. So let's look at some of Abraham's struggles and yet how God continued to renew um, the covenant with him. The first thing we're going to see is that Abraham struggled to find faith, to find the faith to leave his past completely behind. Abraham finally left Haran, but he took Lot with him. Genesis 12, 1, God's specific instructions. What were they? Leave your country, leave your kindred, and kindred is the birthplace. Leave your family, leave your lineage, according to the strong concordance and his father's house but instead he took lot with him he was still unwilling to break ties completely with the past it was as if abraham was saying abraham was saying i believe in you god i have enough faith in you to leave Ur behind but not my family i am re reminded of a testimony of a missionary where she was fearful to bring um, her children to this country because it was there was a lot of hostility there and um, the Lord said um, you can leave your children here in the United States and you take care of them or you can bring them to the country that I am drawing you to and I will take care of them and to me that speaks volumes amen 
um, sometimes trying to do things our way, but God has a greater plan. As a matter of fact, the children are very much involved, grown up and very much involved in ministry even today. It is understandable, right? Lot was his nephew, son of his brother Haran, who had died in Ur. No doubt Abraham felt a familiar duty to his dead brother to care for his son Lot. So they traveled together. But remember, God had told Abraham to leave all his family behind. How often do we do that? We set out in faith, but we take too much baggage with us. Loss of the past, family troubles, bitterness, hurt, or we cling to the familiar, hoping God will be satisfied with half measures and mediocre sacrifice. Then we get caught there like Abraham, halfway between our old life and the life God has promised us. But God is calling us to press on. We must not stop halfway to obtain the promise of God. God appeared to Abraham when he arrived in the land of Canaan and said, in Genesis 12, 7, Unto thy seed will I give this land. This shows God's progressive revelation. Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. When he arrived, God said, This is it. Abraham built an altar on a mountain east of Bethel and called on the name of the Lord. He pitched his tent between Bethel, which means the house of God, and Ai, which means heap or ruin. He was still at a crossroads in his life. Now, further in the story, we see that Abraham and Lot finally parted ways. What happened after Abraham and Lot parted ways? God renewed his promise with Abraham. Now he was starting to follow exactly what God wanted him to follow. God bless Abraham and Lot also grew and flourished in the overflowing of blessings that poured unto his uncle. But Lot never fully committed to God. Sometimes people will become a hindrance for us drawing closer to the Lord. And God is waiting for us to part ways so that he can clearly lead our direction. Strive and sue among their herdsmen, and Abraham gave Lot the choice of all the land before them. Lot, showing his true colors, he chose the well-watered plains and rich grazing land of Sodom. First, he set his tent facing Sodom. Then he sat in the gate of Sodom. Finally, he lived in a house in Sodom. The Bible says he grieved his righteous soul day by day with the evil of the city. Yet, he never moved. It's one thing knowing, it's another thing acting upon it. Even when two angels came to save him, only because of Abraham's intercession, Lot barely escaped with his two daughters. After Abraham parted from Lot, God was able to renew and expand the covenant with Abraham. And we see that in Genesis 13, verses 14 through 17. And it says, And the Lord said unto Abraham, After, the lot, after that, Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it to thee. Despite the renew and expanded covenant God made with him in Canaan, Abraham still struggled to believe God would provide for and protect him. This is what happened. Famine struck the land of Canaan, and Abraham went down to Egypt. Genesis 12.10 Now there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. At the first sign of trouble in Canaan, Abraham fled to the familiar to a land that had another great river system like Euphrates. Abraham did not trust God. He did not trust that he could provide for him right where he was. 
Abraham felt that he had to take matters into his own hands, so he went down into Egypt. That's me. Sometimes we want to take things into our own hands instead of trusting God. Not only did he go down to Egypt, he also lied in Egypt concerning Sarai, his wife, and he asked of her that she would say he was his sister for the sake of his life. Let's read Genesis 12, verses 11 through 20. And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarah, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. So it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman that she was very beautiful. The princess of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male, donkeys, male, and female servants, female donkeys and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, there is, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. One mistake, going to Egypt, led to another. Abram assumed the Egyptians would kill him in order to take his beautiful wife. So Abram lied, not trusting God to protect him and his wife from the Egyptians. In fact, Pharaoh sent for and took Sarai into the palace, as we read. No doubt the devil hoped to corrupt the righteous line and short-circuit God's plan. But God was still with Abraham. God plagued Pharaoh, protected Abraham and Sarai, and brought them out of Egypt safely. God even blessed Abraham with abundant cattle and servants. But back in Canaan, Abraham went back to the altar he built at the beginning. Many a times in our life, that's the thing to do, to go back to that first altar that we built with the Lord. Genesis 13, verse 3 and 4 says, And he went on his journey from the south, as far as Bethel, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there, had made, made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. What a beautiful picture of renewed commitment. When we fail, as we will, we need to get back to our first altar, our first commitment. Often when we fail, the devil will camp on our shoulders and start a whisper campaign. God will never forgive you. You're too much of a failure. Why even try to get right with God? He is too righteous. He will never take you back. But remember, the devil is a liar. Jesus died for us when we were yet sinners. God did not reject Abraham. Despite his failures, he will not reject you. So God renewed his covenant with Abraham and promised to lead him and his descendants. God promised Abraham again that he would have a son and a multitude of descendants. In Genesis 15, 6, it says, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. This is one of the most powerful verses in Scripture. It's one of the most often quoted Old Testament Scriptures in the New Testament because it shows that Abraham's faith was the basis of his relationship with God. Long before the law was given by Moses, Abraham's faith was counted for righteousness. This was a promise to stretch and boggle the mind of a childless man with a barren wife. Yet Abraham believed God when he promised Abraham would be the patriarch of a huge nation. He embraced the promise and believed it. He even clung to it. Yet Abraham's faith was not absolute. He still questioned God. 
in verse 8 of chapter 15 of Genesis says, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Inherit it. Just because we believe does not mean we do not have questions or doubt. And in response to Abraham's question, God formalized a binding, a binding covenant with him. And in verse 17, he says, And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. But what did this vision symbolize? The furnace is a place of intense heat where metal is melted and purified, then heated to be pounded and formed. Abraham and, who, and his descendants would be tried and tested. Genesis 13, 15, it says, Then he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. They would face a furnace, but like Job, they could say, When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. We see that in Job 23.10. And then came a burning lamp. God's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, according to Psalm 119, verse 105. Even in times of testing and trial, we have God's promise that he will never leave us and will always lead us. That is the covenant God made with Abraham. God did not promise a smooth and easy life. But he gave Abraham an assurance that while passing through the fire to purify and shape him and his people, God would also be there to guide them every step of the way. Genesis 15, 18 reads, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Abraham still struggled to believe for the promised child. Let's go to Genesis 16, verses 1 through 4, and then we'll jump to verse 15. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abraham, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham heeded the voice of Sarai. This, then Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abraham, to be his wife, after Abraham had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. So Hagar bore Abraham a son, and Abraham named his son whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Now, being barren in the culture back then, it was a stigma. Yet, they waited and waited for the promise to come. But Abraham, even though he was 75 years when he left Haran, he remained faithful to God for 11 years waiting on that promise. After he left Haran, Abram and Sarai, they hatched a backup plan. You know, a lot of times we seem to need to help God because it's just not happening fast enough. But in their mistake that they were doing, they used Hagar, Sarah's handmaid, as a surrogate mother, and Ishmael was born. But I'm telling you, that was not God's plan. We need to learn to wait on the Lord. For God's plan to f come to flourishing, not us helping God to devise a plan that is not God's plan. God renewed his promise of a miracle child, but still Abraham and Sarai, they doubted. We see in Genesis chapter 17 verses 4 and 5, it says, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham, for a father of nations have I made thee. Verses 15 and 16, And God said unto Abraham, 
As for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt call her name, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. We would expect Abraham to be thrilled with the renewal of a promise he had first received decades before. But instead, Abraham laughed at the promise and pleaded on behalf of Ishmael. Let's read verse 17 and 18. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Still, God insisted that Sarah would bear a son. Not, longer, not long after, God arrived at Abraham's tent with two angels in human form and again affirmed that Sarah would soon bear a son. Sarah overheard from the tent, and she to laugh at God's promise of a child. Verse 12 and 13 of Genesis 18. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being also old? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child, since I am old? When confronted with this, Sarah lied to God's face, denying she had laughed. God stated the simple truth. No, but you did laugh. We see that in verse 15. But God did not punish or reject them because of their unbelief. And then God asked a simple, powerful question. We need to ask this to ourselves. Is anything too hard for God? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Even today, whether we have faith in God, really boils down to that simple question. Finally, at 100 years old and 90 years old, respectively, Abraham and Sarah bore Isaac. Isaac means laughter. Once God's promises had made them laugh in disbelief, but now the fulfillment made them laugh with joy. Abraham and Sarah did not receive their promise because their faith never wavered. Their faith was not perfect through all the years, but that is not what God remembered or what the scripture focuses on. Let's go to Romans chapter 4, verse 19 through 21. It says of Abraham, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered. It says he staggered not, but I want to give the definition of staggered in the Strong's Concordance. It gives some of the definition and it says separate thoroughly, withdraw from or oppose. So Abraham did not oppose, did not separate or withdraw from the promise that God had made him. It says... He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded. Persuaded means fully known. He was, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. God did not consider Abraham weak in faith, but strong. In fact, scripture calls him the father of the faithful, in Romans chapter 4, verse 16. Abraham was human and failed at least seven times according to what is recorded in Scripture. Still, God chose to focus on his faith and fulfill his promises to Abraham. This should give us hope. Proverbs 24, 16 says, For a just man falleth seven times and rises up again. I'm telling you, we have to rise to the occasion. Amen. And I want to conclude with the writing of Brother Mackey as he sees Abraham's story in perspective. The question is, can I really do this? Lost in troubled thought, Abraham could hardly focus on the rocky path ahead, leading toward the distant peak of Mount Moriah. 
Leaving her was one thing, but how could God ask this of me? I, it made no sense. Isaac was the promised child. He was the one they had waited for so long. He was their laughter in their old age. What would Sarah say when Abraham returned without their son? The thought was almost enough to break him. But no, Isaac was the promised child. The Lord's words echo back to Abraham. In Isaac shall thy seed be called in Genesis 21, 12. Abraham felt a sudden surge of hope. Was it possible that God could raise the dead? Well, of course he could. Hadn't God asked them once? Is anything too hard for the Lord? The answer was clearly a resounding no. If Abraham did offer up Isaac, God would have to raise him from the dead. Faith swelled in Abraham and he quickened his steps. They were nearing the foot of the mountain. He turned to his servants. Abide ye here, he said. I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Genesis 22, 5. Even as he spoke the words, somehow he knew it was true. Even if God had to raise Isaac from the dead, they would both return from the mountain. Abraham and Isaac began to climb. Abraham's heart began beating faster and not because of the steep path. What was Isaac saying? In verse 7, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? What could Abraham tell his son? How could he tell Isaac that today Isaac was the sacrifice? Still Abraham was clinging to his faith. My son, God will provide himself a, a lamb for a burnt offering. Verse 8. Where did that come from? Abraham thought. Yet it had a ring of deep truth to it. A prophetic ring. They had reached the top of the mountain and Abraham began stacking stones to build an altar. He laid the wood in order. Then he turned to Isaac. There was a light of realization in Isaac's eyes. There was fear there, but also resignation and courage. Isaac held out his hands, wrists together to be bound. With Isaac laying back on the wood, Abraham drew out his knife. His heart was hammering. God will raise him, he thought. Surely God will raise him. Abraham tends to bring down the blade. Abraham, Abraham, the angel of the Lord's voice boomed out from heaven. Abraham froze. Here am I. The words came out as a gasp. Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. Verse 12. Sudden tears of relief filled Abraham's eyes. He lowered the knife, cut the bones from his son, and they hugged each other tightly. Then Abraham saw it behind him. The whole time was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. God truly had provided a substitutionary sacrifice, and Abraham offered it in the place of his son. I want to remind you that there is nothing impossible for God. That he is here to help us to become faithful in our pursuit for the promises that we have. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus and not dwell on the situation. Let's follow his instructions to the T and believe that God will do that which he promised. God bless you.